Well, welcome to Belfast Wheel. Uh, my name is Jonathan Watson, and today's guest is Gareth Timmons. Uh, Gareth is a former World Marines Commando. He has spent time in Iraq, Somalia, Egypt, and Afghanistan. Since leaving Afghanistan, he has worked for several ultra high net worth individuals in London, whilst providing uh, physical security and business development consultancy to blue chip companies in the city of London. Gareth has a diploma of higher education in psychology and a BSc honours in forensic psychology. Recently, uh, he founded Not Point Projects, a quintessential British fitness and adventure brand, specialising in distinctive outerwear and essential tools inspired by the Royal Marines' high standards of excellence and performance. His book, Becoming the 0.1%, How to Build an Elite Mindset, uh, which covers 34 lessons from a Royal Marines commando recruit, is out now, and that's the book, book there. So, yeah. Gareth, thank you very much for, yeah, Gareth, thanks very much for coming on. Um, I have to say, your mic? I, I seen the ad for the book. Um, that was the first thing that came up. And as soon as I seen Mindset, um, Royal Marines, I thought, I have to get you on. And it was just a call to send a wee email out and see, see if we got lucky. Um, Gareth, just to get started, uh, what got you into signing up for the, for the Royal Marines? Yeah, so I uh, I'd played rugby prior to 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 joining the Marines uh, at a higher level. I'd played for Leeds Rhinos and Bradford before that, and it, it kind of all came crashing down. Jonathan, uh, it, I'd kind of looked over the parapet, and it wasn't really what I what I expected, and I'd, and I'd kind of become, in a sense, saturated by it. I no longer really wanted to do it when I look back in detail and. I left, but I, all, I, I always wanted to be kind of, I wanted to be really elite and just and just see what my mind and body, what I were capable of doing uh, on this planet in a sense. And I didn't stumble across it straight away. I'd been, I'd, I'd been out one night and then I got a brief exposure to Sky News uh, that was showing the Marines looking for Saddam Hussein's sons, Uday and Kuse in Iraq. And I just, I just thought that's exactly... What, what I want to do, I want to just go out there and be like one of the elite operators and, and especially we're very, very keen to go to war, unbelievably. Uh, so I was just drawn to it and the Marines, you could argue, were and, and are the best and that's where I wanted to be. I didn't want to take nothing away from it, but I didn't want to go in the Army or, or the Navy because I kind of deemed that anybody could do that. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to really, really test myself and just, I didn't think I could do it, but just really test myself and just see how far I could get. Yeah. I remember in, in the book, um, you mentioned that your, your father, I think, if I can remember, he, he, he played rugby as well. And you were kind of surrounded um, in a way by that kind of like high level, uh, yeah. competitive environment. And I, I take it that had a big influence as well. Absolutely. No. Uh, I'd always been in, in, in kind of, from being a really young boy when I was born, my, my dad was a strength and conditioning coach at Castleford Tigers, which is a a big first division club up north, in the north of Yorkshire. And uh, I'd always been, when I say saturated by it in, in the previous comment, it, just because I'd, I'd been in the dressing rooms as, as a young lad. So I'd, by the time I'd, I kind of were knocking on the door of turning full-time pro myself, I'd kind of seen it all for the last 10, 15 years, and it was, I just got a bit saturated by it. But yeah, absolutely, my dad were very, uh, you could say very professional, but also pushed me into rugby uh, and wouldn't settle for anything less than, than than perfection, really. There were quotes all over the house as I was getting older and uh, I, I was watching tape on NFL players and rugby league, and it was just a very, very kind of... Uh, grooming atmosphere towards being a, a I suppose an, a, an eye level athlete really yeah. um, and I know basically that everyone I mean, lives in the UK you see the advertisements on TV well Marines even in the cinema um, we've all everyone's heard most people have heard of the Royal Marines what, what is a Royal Marine commando and what is their role uh, just for anyone who's maybe not familiar with, with what, what to do yeah so Royal Marine Commandos is a bit of a misconception that people think that that we that we with the Navy or that we we predominantly operate at sea. Uh, it's very true, but 
uh, we are like the elite kind of shock troops for the UK. And when anything happens uh, domestically or internationally, we, we go straight there, uh, whether it's land or sea. Uh, and we just respond on the front line to, to, to anything from a, to the, the mountains of Afghanistan to Iraq. But also we've, we were the first out when uh, it was the tsunami in, in Thailand to do humanitarian aid. So we just kind of, we just utilise to solve a problem quickly uh, and, 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 just, and just kind of always get that result really. But we, we predominantly uh, specialise in, in like commando raid stuff like cliff assaults, uh, you could say water insertion and, and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it's I say from 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 reading the book and, and listening to the audio book as well. And again, if anyone's watching this, I do recommend uh, buy the book and also get the the audio book because the audio book br- brings it. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like they both both complement each other. But you, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. From, it's from, it's strange because I have tried to uh, I've tried to sell that narrative, but I don't want it to look like I'm being a yeah. a salesman. And I'm like, you need to buy both, you need to buy both. But they absolutely do. It's like you, well, I've, I've, the, the audio book bring, brings the book to life. Yeah. It's the only way I can, I can kind of describe it. And it does that in a sense where, because of the, the, the diary entries and the, the written on the day, it just perfectly brings it to life, which is, yeah. which is incredible, really. Yeah, because I've asked, I can uh, that's very sorry about Sally, but I, did, I, I was actually sad to reach the end of the audiobook. Um, because you, you, I'm not, not just saying this, but you, you genuinely go on the journey with, with yourself. Um, and the I forget, apologies, I forget the, the voice actor who did the, the younger you. Um, you really go on a journey with, with, with yourself. And I was out, uh, I was on holiday, as, as I told you, in Poland. I was going for yeah. runs, and I was just. I don't think someone running with you, telling you about I was doing this and this day, and then we did this. It was, um, yeah, it, it, you kind of you do go on that journey, and I said at the end of it, um, at the end of it, you, you, it, it was like sad to actually read because like, well, that's the book finished. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because uh, like a, a lot of people have said it, and also that the people that said like they're, they're not readers. But yet they've they've not been able to put it down, and some people, I mean, some people have said like they've never read a book, and that's the first book they've ever read, and it's just unbelievable to to kind of to have to have managed to touch people in that way. Yeah, uh, kind of gone off off, kind of jumping ahead. But do you do you think um, the way that about obviously going into a whole big uh, deep dive into it? But do you think where the world is now? Um, the way society is, everything's so divisive and all this. Do, do you think books like books like that, like your book, um, as a I think as a species, we've reached a point where we're kind of that's that's what we're thirsty for that kind of um, deep deep understanding of, of who we are. Do you think do you think that's that the books successfully tapped into that that first? Yeah, absolutely. I think that. I think that as human beings, we always want to be somebody that we're not or something that we're not. And we're always trying to get better or, or work out the, the magical formula. Uh, and I just think that there's just been a massive spotlight in recent times on, on, on in a sense, people's sexuality, uh, mental health is, is another big one as well. And just, tr- I think just trying to really level things up uh, and, there's definitely been a spotlight on on mindset and the mind and getting people to tap into it and and reflect on on how they're thinking and I think mindset books like what what I've wrote definitely help to uh, to kind of massage that really and 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 give people the tools that they need to 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 often see things that are not purely visible in the face kind of thing. And that's why I wrote it like I did in terms of the lessons and stuff, just because I'd finished 
eight years at, at university and I just thought there's so much that I've learned that we just don't know yeah. and that we, we, we're not told at school it's 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 absolutely incredible so I just it just allowed me to kind of to, to put some of that in yeah because I was interviewing uh, Daniel Ingram Brown. Fine enough, he lives in the same uh, city as you live in, and uh, right. he, he he wrote children's books. And uh, also, point of it, there, there's a lot kind of like uh, stuff like even like he he's covering that that's not taught in school, um, and it, it's reshaping. I mean, the, the book there, there's lessons in that book itself that um, I think kids should be taught um it's, it's just yeah it's, 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 it's i think there's a lot missing um i just said even i don't know kind of being about here with the education system but it's the stuff that i think in that book that i think if it was taught to children taught the children and especially early teens um, yeah but yeah. would make would, would make their journey i think a lot more not not any less harder but they give them the tools to cope with, with some things um, yeah, and especially yeah. going into their, further their education and in the job market, etc. Sure, I com- I completely agree. I completely agree, and that's what I wanted to do. And I would just, I were always kind of in, intrigued in psychology, more so to who I was as a person when I was younger and why I was so eager and willing to experience war, uh, and the contrast in me now and the and the and the young lad back then. I, I just wanted to look understand what, what it we're all about and why we just seem to be have an inability to live in, in harmony and why we always want to fight each other uh, and we can't live in peace and that's why I started exploring ex, uh, exploring psychology but it wasn't until I got like got into it that I just thought like you said I just can't believe that we're not taught this at school it's just it's just crazy some of the stuff that is in the book. I, 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 you should be taught it at school because it it would make young lives or society a better place. I, I think definitely, and and we'll definitely get into some because I wrote some of the lessons down, not all of them. Um, again, I recommend purchase the book and, and, and go go through them. But we'll we'll touch on some today. The the title of the book. Um, I actually remember the advertisement. The the title of the book was inspired by the famous ninety nine point nine percent need not apply. Um, can you explain that for anyone who's maybe uh, that doesn't remember the advertisement or doesn't? Not yeah. Yeah. So I suppose the most harrowing uh, advertisement that that's that's gone for the Marines was uh, an advertisement that depicted a couple of young lads, but a young lad in particular who is running across the endurance course, which is the first commando test. Although that's not explicit, if you don't know, uh, and he goes under the the water tunnel and he keeps getting stuck it's called the sheep dip and it keeps saying where'd you quit here here or here and it keeps going up up in increments and it's it's an arrowing kind of and it's got an element of mystique to it and he gets up and he finds resolve and continues and then you see him at the very end and he's on a rigid radar going in operations with his green beret on uh, and the tagline comes up 99.9 percent need not apply and uh, it was actually a statistic uh, at one point in 2003, 2004, where only one in a thousand was successful in getting to the end and getting the Green Beret. And it wasn't necessarily on starting training, but it was from making contact with the careers office and people not being successful at that stage or people at, at various stages, people dropping out. So when I came to write up the diary, I needed a really strong title and but also something that depicted a journey towards something. Uh, and I just came across becoming the 0.1%, which kind of flipped the old advert on its head and it would just work really well. Yeah. And I would just, the funny thing is, is like when I went to uh, the publishers and the publishers started pitching for the book, uh, I was scared to death that they were going to change the title because it, it, I just loved it. Uh, and it were a bit of, if you know, you know, kind of thing. But they, 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 they said, look, we love it. We, we, we're keeping it. Uh, and I was just absolutely delighted. Yeah. It, it, it's, it was a great title. And I think it, it, 
I think you can take that. That's the thing with the book. The book isn't just about a, isn't just a, like a military diary. There, there's a lot of stuff in the book that's transferable to everyone's life. I mean, I know before we start uh, recording, you mentioned there's pregnant women who've reached out to you, said that the book helped them deal with um, yeah pregnancy, difficult birth. And I think that that's the thing with the book. It, 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 even the title. There's loads of things in life that we maybe strive for, but you're if you break out of that comfort zone again, we'll get into that more later. But if you break out of that comfort zone and strive for something that's really difficult in maybe civilian life, or as a degree or a certain job, not uh, not trying to say that they're they're similar to the Royal Marines, but that there maybe is a high uh, chance that you might not be successful. So it kind of taps into. I think taps into those kind of things very successfully. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I spoke recently on a podcast where I just think that the, 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 the might be deviating away from your question a bit, but the, the people that the people that go for it uh, and the people that they're now successful are, in a sense, you, you're so like in a sense entrepreneurial because. You're taking on massive, massive risk. And I think the beauty about how the course is engineered is that you, no matter how fit you are and how mentally tough you are and what background you've come from, you're all in a collective where you don't know whether you can do it. And it, even at the very end of training, when you're doing the commando tests, you still don't know that you can do it until it's literally done and you've crossed the bridge on the 30 miler. And I think that's just absolutely how the how they've engineered the course is just is just absolutely incredible, and it absolutely shatters your stereotypes of of what you grow up to believe as a young lad is is in a sense the alpha male, and I hate the term alpha male because I, I think it's a bit of a corny uh, label for for a man really, yeah. but it, I suppose it does it does that. Uh, where you're looking at these people and you're thinking he's definitely going to do it based on appearance and after a couple of weeks he's going home because he's literally crying for his mum on his bed and it, and what you're left with at the end is just a load of kind of misfit people that are, for all intents and purposes look like geeks but they're all just so mentally tough it's 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 an incredible journey yeah it, 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 it definitely captures that in, in book um, I remember in the book you mentioned there was ones who were kind of like uh crack crack me if I'm wrong in this description and they're kind of like what went off kind of I've got this and they were quite loud and oh, that, that was easy and pretty much I think the first month or the first few weeks they were all kind of that's it voice, voice yeah now. yeah so they were yeah like, absolutely yeah I mean there were there were lads at the start that'd be like saying like don't do this, do that, or do this, or I'm going to bang you out. And uh, it's quite a really, it was a really raw and intense environment. And uh, yeah, they all left. They all, they all kind of left. And you were like, in a sense, kind of like flabbergasted that that was the reality. You just couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was just, it was slowly rewriting everything that you like to believe about uh, what is tough. And it's just not visual when you see somebody and some you often hear somebody says, oh God, I won't want to mess with him, but it's just a complete facade. Yeah. I, I, I suppose it, 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 these people who kind of go into that, they've built up this kind of, like a paper tiger. And yeah. And to go into that environment, it's just punts right through. Uh, there's no yeah, you, you, behind it. That's it. You get like, it's a, it's a great way of putting it, mate. It's uh, you get found out instantly. You get found out instantly. They put pressure on you like you wouldn't believe. Obviously, you've you've read the book, but the sleep deprivation as well. Uh, people just un, un, unravel uh, mentally. It's uh, it's incredible. There's one question I want to touch on that kind of, um, and I know in the book you, you talk about how, how the whole inception of the book started. It was it was basically your mum. Um, you brought the train station waiting to get the train which would take you down to Limstone and your mum might came out with a, with a diary in her hand yeah sure uh, 
I'd done terrible at school and uh, for all intents and purposes, didn't think that was very academic. But I was just so focused on turning pro at rugby that I'd, I was like, oh, I don't need school. And it was just such a miscalculation because uh, when the rugby didn't work out, I was kind of really left in a, in a terrible transitional phase. And just as I got fast forward, I mean, I'd, I'd gone through the, the three-day selection process, the PRMC, Potential Royal Marines course, and I was just getting on the train to go down to Limston. And my mum just kind of scuttled away and came back with a diary uh, and just give me it as the train doors were shutting and just kind of said through the glass, like, just write things down, anything. Uh, I want to know what you've been doing and it'll help, it'll hopefully help you cope. And I just took it and I was like, what on earth is that like? Of all the things that you could that you could give me, you've given me that. I mean, it was just like, do you not know who I am as a person? So I took it and I, I ended up, I was on the train on the way down. And it's one of the moments where you can, you're strapped in and you're like, oh God, I can't believe what I'm doing. I, I want to get off. You, there's an element of excitement there, but also massive trepidation. And I just couldn't believe what, what, what I were doing. So I just opened the diary and wrote in it. And I've always had like OCD. Uh, always from being from being a from being a baby really, or, or born with it. And once I'd wrote in it, I just felt then completely compelled to write in it every day, and that's and that's what I did and captured something that that has that has never been captured before. Yeah, uh, and the I said I'm sure. Uh, Again, reading uh, the book, was there times it was difficult to kind of maintain that? I take it, I think I remember in the book, there was maybe days where you were just, uh, I think the words you used was hung out. You were, you were, you were coming in after a few days and, and then you just kind of wait, what, what to do on this day? So it was kind of, is that the way you kind of kept trying to cap up with it? Yeah, I mean, there were days where two or three days would go by where I, where I just, I couldn't physically write in it because we hadn't been to sleep. And I like, I would be beyond exhausted. But what I did do is, especially in the field, I wrote like keywords or or little sentences on me and on my hands or on my arms. And then I just transferred it to the diary when I could. I wrote in the field as well. I wrote it in the field as well. But yeah, at times it were just it were incredibly, incredibly tough to keep and and added such a layer of pressure onto what already was a very stressful environment. But uh but yeah, I just I just I just kept doing it and yeah. just and just kept it up. And some of the lads said, look, you might be able to write a, a book one day, but it, it was never my intention to write, to, to kind of bring it to life like I had. I'd, I didn't really know why I were doing it, yeah. uh, other than just to kind of look back on on what we'd actually been through. Uh, but yeah, I just, just felt completely compelled, Jonathan, to, uh, to, to, to keep it. And, and, and like, thank God I did. Yeah, no, definitely, I mean, absolutely. Um, the, the, with, the, with the training, you're, the, 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 the book goes in detail of, of obviously the training that you went through. Um, the, the two hardest things I think I kind of pulled from it, it's I think sometimes people would be underestimate the kind of thing. Well, I would think that obviously will be hard. I think for me, uh, reading the book, I think the sleep deprivation, deprivation and the rat and dry routines seem to be, I think for me, the most like, psychologically brutal that yeah I, I think it was going to break you. It would be one of those, those two. Could you could you explain the whole sleep deprivation and Latin dry routine? Yeah, sure. So I think the main uh, construct of fabric that is the training to become a Royal Marine is sleep deprivation, especially in the first ten or fifteen weeks. And just to give you an example or two examples, but the first is, is that at the very start of training, you're in a place called foundation, which is a bit like a, the, 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 the getting you accustomed to military life and, and how things are run, like breaking the connection between the civilian and the, and the military world. And it's, and it's very harshly done in a sense. And you you could have 60 people uh, that, you have to wash and iron and clean your clothes for the following day and prep for inspection. The problem with that is, is especially in foundation and in the first couple of weeks of first, however many weeks of training is, 
is that there's no washing machines and there's no dryers. There's only two sinks and then a drying room. And all the lads can't get through that on a night uh, effectively and under time to get a good night's sleep. So you have to kind of share the share the pain, as you will. And then you've got to dry your clothes and, and sometimes the, the, the barely dry the following day, but that process just keeps you up all night. Uh, and if you have, in the first, say like six to eight weeks, if you have three to four hours sleep a night, you're doing well. Uh, and that just, it just slowly, slowly wears you down. And you've got so much on the following day, very much like school uh, lessons. You have periods of an hour blocks of, of each thing. And I, and, and I mean, even like in the diary in, in between week eight and 10, in that two week period, we had 10 hours sleep. And it seems absolutely incredible, but they kept us up for five days solid to the point where there were lads literally falling asleep, stood up. Uh, and you'd, you'd catch them before they hit the floor and then it'd be you. You just like instantly just switched off uh, because your body was <clears throat> in a sense shutting down. And it's so brutal. You literally fall asleep anywhere for like half an hour and then you woke back up and you're in this really, really stressful environment. And yeah, that's the like, that's the sleep deprivation side of it. But and then there's the wet and dry, which you could you could say to anybody is the most brutal part of it. And that is basically in order to stay operational in the field, you have to uh take two sets of clothing in. The one that you're wearing and you, you have a dry set of clothing. The, the key is to always keep that dry set dry because you get into your sleeping bag with that. And if you but if you get into your sleeping bag in wet clothing, your sleeping bag can no longer provide the heat insulation so you can go down with hypothermia. What it means is, is that if you get wet and they've got us wet every single night by taking us into like big pool, puddles of water or whatever, that you have to get out your wet clothes and put your dry clothes on to get in your sleeping bag. But then when you get up for century or up the following morning, you have to get out your, your wet clothes, sorry, out your dry clothes and put your wet clothes back on. And it's just the most brutal process ever, especially, I mean, it was minus 15 on Dartmoor at one point and we were having to do that and lads were literally smashing their, uh, the, the trousers and the shirts off, off trees just to loosen them up to put them on because they'd frozen during the night. And it's just brutal. Yeah, I, 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 I was, when I was listening to this, again, I was out for once listening to the book. When you're here, trust me, if you're running and you get that wee voice going, getting tired, and you're listening to that, <laughs> you just go, come on, this is easy compared to what you want free. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's funny, mate, because uh, 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 a friend of mine that I did a, a podcast with recently uh, is just on the West Island Way. and it were about 10 or 50 miles uh, off completing it and he were in a really, really terrible state. Uh, and he started listening to the book and he completed it. <laughs> but he ended up on crutches. He had to go to a &E after. And he ended up on crutches and his, his feet are in a terrible, terrible state. But, uh, yeah, just incredible. Incredible. Because yeah. I think when, if you're doing a train yourself and you, you hear an account like that, you, you, your excuses are nothing. It, it, you just kind of go, yeah. Okay, come on. The, I think for anyone kind of really who's this is kind of new to them, maybe kind of you know, when there's train like this exists. It, I suppose ultimately it's not the, the training staff doing this for, for their own pleasure. They're, they're doing this so ultimately, if you go to war or go on operations, you you come back essentially. You're not going to kind of yeah. you know, for, for, for the toil in and your hands up to say I surrender. You're, you're gonna, yeah. You're gonna be able to take it. Am I right in saying that? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, just just to put it, that really in context, it's like the false endings where they'll like say, right, you're going back to camp, and the bus will turn up to take you back to camp, and all of a sudden they'll give you more rations, and the bus will drive away, and you've got to stay in the field. And it's like redefining your expectation, but accepting quickly. Uh, and then you'll have been like yomping with all your kit over Senny Bridge 
and you'll be going to an helicopter extraction and it doesn't turn up the helicopter and you have to then get to the final RV. And you just think it's really, really cruel. And it, and you know what it really is. And it, and it does break you. Uh, and it can have catastrophic consequences. But then, as an example, when you get on operations like uh, a really good friend of mine, they did an operation in Elmond where they, they, they went into this Taliban stronghold to disrupt it. And one of the lads got killed straight away. And then they, they ended up being in contact with the Taliban for about seven hours. And they run out of ammunition once or twice and to get resupplied. And when it were time to pull out, the RAF said that they wouldn't come in because it was a hot LZ. So they had to basically walk out or yomp out is, is the military term with all the kit yeah. uh, for about 10 or 15 miles through the mountains in July. And that just kind of, uh, that's why it's done yeah. for, for moments like that. But it, it, even then, he just said it was the worst thing that he's ever, ever been through in his life because they were exhausted and knowing that they had to walk out of it and not get taken out to safety. He said it was just absolutely horrendous. But it's moments like that in training that are, that are unbelievably well-crafted simulations that prepare the mind for, for operations, like you've just said. Yeah, because I know in the book, you, you I think... Is it midway through the book or to the end? I know you mentioned um, really the ultimate goal of the Royal Marines that, 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 that what they're trying to foster is that whoever you go up against in the field, use your uh, better train, um, better discipline, and have a better mindset than the enemy. It's, it, it's uh, I hope, excuse this term, I suppose it's like a sport, it's like, it's like a team. Um, where the, the, the coach, the head coach goes, I want this team to be the best. So whoever we go up against, we we will we we just have that culture of winning. Uh, that be yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. Mate, it's exactly that. It's exactly that. It's like uh, it's like a thirty man squad that is that all knows the role uh, and knows what the other person's capable of doing and got that ultimate trust and just that ultimate desire to succeed because you have to. And I, and, and I think the discipline that is instilled into us in training in order to get to the end, it just produces just that where you, I suppose you go on operations and you've just got the edge. You've just, you will go to places that uh, I suppose the enemy are just not prepared to in terms of a discipline standpoint. Uh, and that, I think that's what makes us so good, is yeah. that we'll just, we're just, we've been to harder places in training, which makes, and that's what they say, it makes operating men in the field, uh, or, or, or in theatre as they call it, very, very, very simple. Not simple by any means, but it makes it, yeah. you've been there before. Yeah, no, that, that, uh, I think that that's a, a really important lesson to think how you train, how you, how you prepare, whether it's for an exam or, or, or for going to work, how it ultimately will, will, have a, will have the big factor, the big impact on on your, your the outcome, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 how disciplined you are. It's it's how disciplined you are uh, in in every aspect of your life, and it it's the attention to detail, uh, like like the wet and dry lesson. It's uh, it's it, it's that thing. It's it's doing all the really really small things that people overlook that give you the edge uh, in, in anything that you do. No, no cutting corners. No cutting corners. Yeah, exactly. Or I think as I think human beings, we just we are just designed to to cut corners because it used to uh, assure survival when we were hunter gatherers. So it is a flaw. In our, in our kind of psychology, but it's kind of just rewiring that and just appreciating that the small things matter uh, and that they're important. Definitely. Uh, going into, uh, again, there's there's 34 lessons within the book. And again, what, uh, I just want to touch on a few of them because um, they're, they're, these are the ones I kind of, like, kind of stood out for myself. In, in lesson seven from the book, um, you wrote, the subtle edge is forged in the shadows and find the mundane 
what we can all take away from the horse practice of wet and dry routine to enhance our performance and optimize our lifestyles. Um, and I think, I suppose we've already touched on that there, is, is, is attention to detail um, and, and yeah, not, not cutting corners uh, and, 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 and do not. How, what, what's the best way for, for someone maybe who, who, who's kind of watching this or whatever, what was the best way for kind of improving that? So you to so you start to kind of focus on the smaller details. That yeah, sure. It's like it, it's like getting up and just what's what's ever in your mind that you know you need to do or that you'd like to do. Just doing it. I know it sounds simple, but just enactment. Just taking the subconscious and, and turning it into the physical, and just creating small habits. And just doing small things, minor adjustments that over two to three to four weeks become fairly ingrained habits. Doing the small things right. And it, it, it's anything really from prepping your meals for the day uh, in a non military sense, getting up and going for a run, just and, and getting a shower, preparing your, your clothing for that day, uh, just not putting yourself on the back foot. We call it in the marine seeing yourself off. You've, you've, you're seeing yourself off. You're not. You're not. Uh, you're not giving yourself the best opportunity. It's about giving yourself the best opportunity for success, and and getting all them responsibilities that you've got that day, and having them done by twelve one o'clock, so that you can move on to other stuff, and you can slowly start building up massive momentum, and over a period of time. You can't see it, but you you're so far ahead of other people, yeah. just on how you've conducted and managed your day, uh, and, and your time discipline. Uh, it, it's setting an alarm and getting up and not snoozing for an hour and a half, and and getting that running in the hour. That's that's kind of what it is. It's it's doing the things that I, I suppose you could call them non-negotiables that you. You don't really, you don't want to do. Yeah. You, there's a conflict inside, but you just, just get out there, just do it. And get it done. And, and that's kind of the message, really, of, of, of that. Yeah. When I was reading the book, there was a, a bit where you were training and they said, uh, I think they said, tops off. And as soon as you mentioned about the, the tattoo, by the way, I kind of thought, I could see where this is going. Can you tell us about, about that and about the RM tattoo and the, coaching staff's reaction yeah yeah uh, there's this thing in the marines where once you pass out you get what's called a core stamp uh, and you either get raw marine commando or the the dagger and the flash or the globe and laurel uh, it's like a, a stamp that you are the raw marine commando the paras do it as well uh, they get the wings but my granddad died when I was six, 16, 17. And as, in a sheer stroke of coincidence, his name was Roger Monks uh, with his initials RM. And I didn't really want to put, get his name tattooed because I just well, like, I know his name. I'll just get RM, subtle, a subtle nod that... Uh, that I was missing kind of thing. And I, and I had it put on my back under a guardian angel, the, the letters RM. When I went for uh, the PRMC, during the, 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 the kind of upper body uh, testing, the press-up testing, the demand that you take your T-shirt off so they can see your chest it in your, uh, your, your partner's hat fist, uh, so you're getting what they call clean full reps. But as soon as I took my top off, I knew straight away when they said tops off, it was like this secret I was trying to, to keep in that they would think that that meant Royal Marines because people do have RM and then the dagger. Uh, so I took my top off and they were like, I've said in the book, it were almost like I'd put my head in a dark cupboard playing hide and six. I didn't want anybody to see me. And it was like that. And I was like, please, please don't see it. Don't see it. And then all of a sudden I had this like, what on earth is that? What is that? 
uh, and they're like, you must be joking. You must be joking. And then uh, all these like big PTIs, really, really intimidating, ran over and really got in my face and just were just like, what on earth do you think you're doing? And just basically saying that I was going to fail as a result. And I tried to kind of tell them what it was about, but you can't. And they just were saying, we guarantee that you're going to fail this this selection. You're going to fail this course. You may as well go home now. And that were on day one, and I had another two days to go, and they just kept saying it every day that uh, they were going to fail me because of this this tattoo. They were having none of it. The thought that I'd... Some people leave during training and get the tattoo, believe it or not. Oh. And that's that's where it... Yeah, that's where it is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was just... Awful, awful. And you know what? It only kind of got put on my radar. I think on the train journey on the way down where a really good friend said, what do you think they'll say to that tattoo on your back? And I was just like, what? And then it dawned on me and I was like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I just, uh, like when I, when I was listening to all you just have, I just have this mental image of these guys just like, like just go on. I can't, how dare you? So I was like, <laughs> like do yeah, some moments church that, yeah. straight over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were like, they were like saying, like, lads have given their lives for that tattoo and stuff, and and it it would it were it were bad. It were really really bad. But uh, but so not intentional. Yeah. This just a random question. Later on, obviously, once you 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 got through the training, etc. Did they? Did they ever ask you about it? Did they ever come say, here, what, what, what does that mean? Or did they, did they ever come back to oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I messed up. I'm, it, this is another story that's, that's kind of not in the diary, but, uh, and I've never really told this story, but in week 10 of training, I went to, uh, to Magaluf with, a, with, a, with, with, with three friends. Uh, and I were in week 10 of training, and I thought I were like, the man, the best thing since sliced bread. And I were like literally in week 10 of training. I were nothing. And there were these two lads around the pool and they just said, Here, mate, are you a, are you a boot neck? Uh, and stupidly, I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm a Royal Marine. And they went, oh yeah, we can see by that, by that uh, tattoo on your back. And they went, what unit are you in? Uh, and I told them and they asked me like what, what company and stuff and I didn't know. And it all started unraveling. Uh, and they basically told me to, to, to walk away or they were going to bang, <laughs> bang me out. Uh, I think they were just as confused as, as what I was at, 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 at where I found myself in that conversation. But they, I think they must have thought, yeah, he, he's definitely in training, but he's got the tattoo and he shouldn't have it. Do you know what I mean? It kind of all, in a weird twist of fate, all kind of sat together. But it was yeah, it was just a massive, massive coincidence. Yeah. Um, in lesson one from the book, um, uh, managing your emotions by utilizing the methods of compartmentalization and mentally strategizing to ensure long-term success is essential to reduce anxiety, self-doubt, and overwhelming effects on emotions. What what is compartmentalization? And how can we use that? Yeah, I think we all kind of naturally do it. And again, it's one of those lessons where it's a lay perspective of psychology that we're, that we're acutely aware of, but we just don't, it's not backed up academically. We don't learn it. And it's just, it just felt really important to include that at the start. And, and that were kind of the theme that came out naturally anyway, but compartment compartmentalization especially in that in that kind of sense is just breaking large goal acquisition and large undertakings down into into manageable chunks that you can you can kind of gain control of the of the adversity and and, and it makes it manageable mentally and how I kind of did it was is that I naturally fell into right I'm going to do a week on I'm going to do training a week at a time and use each week as a as a success, as a building block towards reaching the end goal. But I never looked any further than that, mm. whereas some lads did. And I think the lads that, well, the lads that did do it, 
bar in a very, very minute view, but the ones that did do it, it was incredibly detrimental to them achieving it because it made it so overwhelming, uh, the task at hand. So I just, I kind of shut it all out and I just did a week at a time of training. And I've used that uh, and it was really, really successful. It, 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 for me anyway, it helped me. And, and I've used that in, in, in everything that I've done since when I've been in Afghanistan and it's, I've started to get a bit fatigued. I've, I've broke it all down to, let's just get to Wednesday then. Wednesday we'll get to, from Wednesday we've got the weekend and we'll get to Monday then. And done it like that. And then I've, I've used it at, at university as well, breaking the, the term times down. And I've just really took control of big events and just really, really compartmentalised it and broke it down. And at the start of the book, that's, that's I think, one of the key lessons, really. I've, I've discussed some of these lessons with a, uh, a pre-military performance programme that I run for young people wanting to join the military. And they always say that that's one of the best lessons that they receive. Yeah. And it's, it is, it's just, it's just breaking it down and making it a doable undertaking mentally. Definitely. Um, because I think, and as, as a police myself, sometimes you come into a goal and you can envision the end where you are, but you forget that. I think when you start going on that journey to, to, to acquire that goal, um, like for example, myself, fine enough, uh, in August, um, I decided to go back to, my goal is to get into university in a few years' time. I have to do my GCSE bars, then I'll do an access course, and then advance the goals, become a, a physio. And to for, for me, where I'm sitting now, it's, it's like going up a mountain. Um, but I think when I read the book, and I talked about that, I thought that was, that really stood out. It was really good because it can be so overwhelming. You feel like, like and I suppose in, in, in the training you were doing, I'm sure it felt like there was no end in sight. It was just rinse and repeat each, each yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that mindset, I think if, if you're in that situation, mentally, that, that's what kind of breaks you because your brain goes, look, revoice your head goes, look, there's no end in sight. If you quit now, it's over with. And it's easy then to kind of go, I'll never achieve it anyway. I, I, I quit. I'm, I'm, I'm out. That's it. I mean, the, the, the thing with quitting on any kind of goal acquisition is this, is that when you quit, you're a lot closer than you were when you started. Yeah. It's mental. It's like just because things have got a bit tough and you're, you're under self-sacrifice and you're, you're uncomfortable and you're experiencing, I suppose, mental discomfort, you're on a journey to getting somewhere better. You, you, you're already thir- further into it than you were when you first thought about it and, 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 and put them plans into action. And to leave and to, to not see it through, I think, is absolutely tragic. It, it's, it's, that's part of it. But it's also what makes reaching the end point so worthwhile is when you've been through that and you've you've become disillusioned with why you're doing it. And that's the biggest obstacle when you when you you question why you're doing something, but you find the resolve to keep going. Uh, it's it's that really. It's it, it, once you're on the journey, there's a reason why you started it. And I know that sometimes you can start something and think, you know what, it's not for me. Uh, and that's fine, but if it's something you really want to do, but then as soon as it gets tough, you quit. I don't understand the rationale in that because you're on your way. Yeah. You're on a journey to, to reach in a place where you're going to be in a better position, either mentally, cognitively, uh, professionally or financially. Yeah. And, and, and I suppose that's what makes a difference between the guys who, who uh, are get, as in the Royal Marines training, I suppose that makes a difference between the guys who quit and the guys who ultimately get, get to the end. It's just they get overwhelmed by what's happening now and they forget why they started and where they're going. And is that, is that right? That, that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, disillusionment creeps in. 
And no matter how much you wanted it, I wanted it more than anything once I'd put my mind to it. Uh, but there's four or five times in the diary where I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, and I'm questioning what I'm doing and that we're even towards the very end. And lads make unbelievably snap decision choices about the future in adverting under sleep deprivation when they're tired and when they're fatigued. And it transfers so much to every everyday life. When you you could be at a massive fallout with your, with your partner or you're really fatigued from work or just the general pulls in life. And what I found in the Marines is, is that people made the decision to leave when they were either really, really tired or we were all worn out. And a lot of people for relationships that they're no longer in. And uh, I just kind of found it absolutely mind-blowing. And in terms of regretting it and living with that regret, there's people that get in touch with me daily and just say, like, they can't believe that they left and that they didn't see it through. And now they're too old to, to do it. Or they've had too many chances. And to live with that, I think, is... Is, is incredibly unfortunate that was, like I say in the diary, the sacrifice to life ratio where, uh, and this is just something I really stumbled across, but it's like, I absolutely told myself before I went in that it was going to be horrendous and that it was going to, I was going to lose all my freedom, but it was only 10 months of my life that I had to endure to live the rest of my life, I suppose, with that title. And for me, that wasn't a difficult trade-off. Yeah, yeah. It just wasn't. Um, this, 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 I have this in my questions, so prepared all these questions. This, this actually one is, is at the very end. Um, I suppose the way this, that, that, what you said there, is almost like the 35th lesson from the book, that we, it, anyone, can, anyone can, can make money, anyone can, can buy a house, buy a car, but when you go on a journey like, like what you did or someone else goes on a, on a kind of a journey, uh, whether it's go up a mountain or go and explore Antarctica or whatever, once you've done that and you, you went through that hardship and you've got to the the, the, the prize, it's a bit like suppose, uh, Joseph Campbell's book, um, The Hero's Journey. Once you've uh, achieved that, it's, it's almost like untold riches that can never be taken away from you. If you, you've you've got that um, wherever you go, it, it's it's within you, um, and ultimately, it, yeah. it's, I suppose it's the only uh, fortune that you take to your grave that nobody's going to come in. The tax man's not going to go away. I'm here for the inheritance tax. Yeah, um, that, no, that's nobody you. can take it away. It, it, it's exactly that, mate, and it, it, it's a superb point. Uh, and it's very similar. I mean, it, it it's transitional, uh, multilateral, really for you wanting to be a physio as well. Once you've got it, nobody can take it away. And I just think that my perspective on things is just that you kind of only live, you only live once uh, in this current form as yourself. Uh, and I just think it's a great tragedy when you don't explore mentally and physically what you're, what you're absolutely capable of doing. Uh, and the limitations within yourself. And I know everybody's got different limitations mentally and physically, but why not explore the boundaries of that and just see what you're absolutely capable of doing? And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. But like you said, on the opposite side of it is is often stuff that, that nobody can take away from you. Uh, like you said, you can lose a job. Uh, you can lose so much in life. But there's there's certain things that you that you do that that endure. With uh, mindset is, is something that's for me. I think it's something I'm, I've been fascinated for for a very long time. Um, and I know that that's what I said when I seen your advertising for your book. That that's why I, I got in touch right away. Um, just 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 seeing the mindset and kind of into it. Is, is the mindset in, in the Royal Marines Commando training? Is mindset something that's discussed or is it something that 
the training and the culture of the Marines that brings that out of you? Or is, is it a bit of both? Yeah. Uh, whether it is now or not, I don't know. But it certainly wasn't when I went in. Uh, and you have no kind of training on it whatsoever, other than the environmental factors that are thrown at you that you have to kind of overcome. And it's probably going to be the topic of something that I write in future, but it's, I find it absolutely fascinating. Is like, where does it come from? And is it within all of us? And is it just the exposure to environment that is lacking for some people? Uh, or is it the desire to seek out that challenge that then in turn develops the mindset. But it's not discussed, mate, at all. It's uh, it's very like uh, very like a really subconscious thing that you can't always see. Mm. Uh, but it, it, I think the mindset that is required, the fundamental aspect of it, is a, is an ability to withstand suffering. Uh, to endure suffering, personal suffering, because that's what you have to do. And you have to be consistent with that uh, and get through it. And and with that ability to endure suffering comes then the ability to, uh, or the wherewithal to, to not quit. And ultimately, if you don't quit, you will get to the end. It's, that's That's the simplest equation that I could ever put on it. Yeah. If you don't quit, you will you will you'll achieve anything. Because um, I'm, I'm a big uh, big fan of history, and there's two two really good examples. Um, the if anyone's familiar with, with the Romans and Hannibal, Hannibal uh, defeated them in the Battle of Cannae, and effectively what that battle meant was the whole Roman army was wiped out. Like, like there, was, there was nothing left to, to fight, and. By those terms, they Romans should have surrendered, but they didn't. They just put the walls up. Says we're not fighting anymore, and start rebuilding. And they ultimately defeated Hannibal. And there was another great example. Like again, me, that, that's more of like a cultural mindset that the Romans had. But there was a great uh, interview I seen uh, about a year ago, and it was a Royal Marine. Uh, I don't know if it was a captain or something, and he was in the Falklands, and he says that they went down in the Falklands. And they were kind of supposed to have helicopter support, but I think the ship that was carrying the helicopters got sunk. So they had them to, to, to march inland. And then on top of that, the equipment they had, um, there was a small, I suppose in the rust to get down to the Falklands, there was, there was a, the, the tents they had weren't suitable for the Falklands. So they had the kind of, they literally had those shelters, they had to kind of hide behind these rocks to break the wind and they're due to go to battle the next day and they're wrapped and cold and, and uh, I think uh, the rations I know you mentioned the, break, the rations weren't great and then he said they, what made it work he says they endured all that being cut off from, from support and all the rest of it but he says the worst thing that angered angered them and kind of dipped their morale so it was the BBC World Service apparently I don't know how this happened announced that they were going to attack um, I think it was Port Stanley. They, they announced that, that this attack was, was happening, but it hadn't. So it kind of gave the Argentine soldiers there kind of what? It hasn't happened. So it kind of raised their guard. So they lost that kind of element of surprise. And he said, went through all the hardship. He says that was the thing that kind of so kicking the ghoulies and kicking the nuts. Um, yeah. yeah. Was, their own side kind of made that, made that mistake. But he said, even with that, they, they, they still went then and um, obviously they, they, they were victorious. Uh, I think it's taking those kind of, if you look at history and like those kind of mindsets from historical people and, and uh, maybe even people who stood firm, like uh, I think there was a, in Auschwitz, there was a priest who um, took the place of a man they were going to, going to execute and executed him instead. I think that was very fine, really interesting, that mindset that, it's powerful. Um, regardless of what you're facing, you you stick to what course of action or what your your morals is. I think it's, it's yeah, awesome. like you, like you, it's it's like a conviction, isn't it? 
it's a conviction. And I, I think we, with the example from Auschwitz and and your previous example, mate, it's like I think when you strongly when you strongly believe in a course of a course of action, but then it's backed up by by self confidence, and that's the key. That is the absolute key. It's having the self the self confidence in the self. Uh, to just see, to just to see it through, you become absolutely unstoppable. Uh, I mean, on, on like on the on the on the when I got to the commando test, I'd, uh, and and I'm not alone in, in in being injured, but I had a a ruptured ACL, left ACL, which meant that my knee just dislocated every now and again, and uh, I had a torn Achilles uh, in my right foot. And I'd only had an hour sleep before the 30 miler. And even with all that, I was still under no uh, illusion that I was, I would get to, I would try to get to the end at all costs. Uh, I had no doubt or anything. I just thought, I'll just keep moving uh, and I'll get to the end. And I think, I, I thought about this recently and it's like, what pushes you on to be successful as a person? And I think it's it's when you you enact what you're thinking into a, a physical representation, but in doing so and finding success and overcoming adversity, which will absolutely come, you start becoming self-confident in yourself. And these increments slowly build until you've got like a, a really, really strong structure that is very, very difficult to to stop. Yeah, and I think it's just it's just giving yourself the opportunity to become self confident. And all these people that you've that you've just meant that you've mentioned have have just demonstrated that that they've just got a level of conviction where that even with death uh, in front of them, the the fully uh, committed to that course of action. And that's really powerful. Yeah. It's really powerful because you can't win. Yeah. Or the other the, the other side can't win. Yeah. Like even with it with killing the priest, they didn't win. It's it's a it's a stronger message than 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 the I, I think than the devastation that, that that episode would have would have caused. Definitely, because I, I remember watching there was a documentary it was on Netflix about the Vietnam War, and they're interviewing the Americans and the the, 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 the Vietnamese, and they interviewed the, the North Vietnamese and said they asked them why did you how, how did you win when you were faced against pretty much the most powerful military force in the world, and they said they said it wasn't about political ideals wasn't about communism it says literally we were fighting to to have a free country that that, that, that we run control of it, it was that it was they're, they're fighting for the country effectively and that's yeah. what ultimately the one because he says he says like we he says you have to understand we were taking casualties like the Ho, Ho Chi Minh trail just we were taking like the, just just when you, when you hear about them trying to transport stuff down the Americans were bombing them, um, obviously trying to stop the, the their military supply line. Like, just kept going. Like, just like maybe really their mates were blew up. It was just like I can't stop. Pick up the equipment and, and keep going. And and just um, yeah, it, 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 it's a mindset. It's, it, it's a subject that deeply fascinates me. And um, yeah, it, it, it's you, you could you could go into hours on it. So you could. Yeah, you could. You could. You could absolutely. And I just. I think really deeply about it. It's almost like I've reached an age where I want to work it out. Yeah. What the magical ingredient is, but I just know that it's ever elusive and it's frustrating. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, but, but yeah, I just want to, I mean, touching on the mindset thing again, is in terms of whether it's kind of elicited in training and discussed, it's not an, 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 I do think there's an element that you're born with, but then environment enhances it. 
but also arguably to get exposure to the environment you must have to be driven to that specific environment or challenge uh, and your mindset does that so it's a very strange kind of coming together of of quite a lot of things that could end up producing something that's quite remarkable yeah because I want to quickly touch on this I know I have a, a friend who've had on the show 20 summers um, he's based in Coventry and I, I trained with Tony I remember Tony telling me a story um, one time he, he trained with uh, legendary martial artist uh, Jeff Thompson and this is kind of like a mindset he was uh, there was a guy came up to him in Coventry and he knew the guy's intent was to start a fight and when he came up to 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 Tony the I think in Tony's mindset's very strong that kind of came out of him and the guy he says the guy just looked at him kind of paused and he said he could see almost his brain going no I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this and I'm, I'm just just walked away from him and I think that's a very there's a, an example of mindset where you it's not like oh I'm, I'm a hard lad and, and, and loud and brass but very quiet and confident and it's kind of um, you, you see the same and you mentioned in the book about the the PTIs in the Royal Marines it's that or you said there was one guy that he was the, the epitome of, of a Royal Marine and it's the same yeah. guys, they don't have to say anything just by look at them you just go mm. there's something there that I'm not going to mess with I'll, I'll go the other way <laughs> He was that guy, yeah. Uh, a guy called Jake Rob, uh, Sergeant Rob, that uh, that caught us in the pub, obviously drinking the the, the pints of urine and stuff. But also, we were always ever present on on bottom field, and uh, the, the back doors would open to to the bottom field from the gymnasium, and you'd have a number of what they call strikers, the PTIs, that come out and they take you for that particular period and you it can be different every day but there's a few of them that you just never want because that session is going to be horrendous and when you saw Jake Rob like kick the back, the back door to the gymnasium open to come onto bottom field you just it was horrific because he just was the most intimidating bloke ever but somebody that how he acted, how he, how he looked. He was just born to be a Royal Marine. And he looked like one and he just, yeah, he was just one scary, scary man. Yeah. It's, 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 it's fascinating. Um, there's, um, and I know we're kind of one at a time, and I feel like there's a whole, there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot we could, could talk about. Um, in, in basically, in, in general society, we're taught to fear failure and disappointment. Um, very much, I know, when I was at high school, they pretty much gave them gave us the message that if you don't do well now, your life is your life is ruined. Um, I remember the the deputy headmaster at our last assembly kind of proudly walked around and says, "I know he's going to succeed. I know he's going to end up in jail. I know he's going to end up in, on the brew." Uh, which is universal credit now. Um, how uh, going into lesson left, lesson eleven, uh, dealing with disappointment, during large challenges, and how misfortune along the way is often not a predictor of success, is merely an illusion. Can you talk about not getting because it ties in with you not getting the PT superior, which I think was a, a red yeah, shirt. Yeah. And how can we deal with disappointment? Because that's the other side of striving for for, for goals is. Maybe in your first test, you might do horrendously or or whatever. I've absolutely spoke about it and uh, it's become quite profound for me uh, now that failure is absolutely the underrated best friend of success. And you cannot have success without failure. And the both are just exactly the same, in a sense. And... I kind of draw on the point in the book, specifically to Lesson 11, uh, that there were a thing called PT Superior at Week 9. And at Week 9, and on the build-up to Week 9, you thought that getting a red vest, one of seven, uh, 
was really, really significant and that it showed you were a bit of a troop favourite and that you were amazing at physical training and fit. But I never, I, I got it, but I didn't keep it at the end because I, I couldn't make some of the rope climbs because I was just exhausted. I'd gone out too hard, but I still passed gym pass out, but I just couldn't technically execute it uh, to get the vest. And the most unbelievable part of that observation when writing the book and, and writing that lesson was, is that the people that got the red vest, uh, none of them passed out of training. So it, it, although we thought it was a really big thing in the road to success and that the people that got it would go on to be 100% Royal Marines and get the green lid, none of them did, they left, or they got back troop for poor performance. So it was quite unbelievable to see that it, it just there's various things that happen on the road to success that are just not key markers of, of that success. And that, in a sense, it's a massive illusion. And that can turn people off. It's just about... It's about perseverance. If you if you fall short and you never do it again, uh, that is failure, really. But if you fall short and you go again and you keep learning from where you, where you went wrong uh, and you, you can readjust and apply that into practice... With perseverance, you're going to get to the end and yeah. you're going to be successful. And there's various points and stages in anybody's journey where you get a bit of luck or a bit of bad luck and it can send you one way or the other. And it's, it's just not an accurate representation of, of where you're going to end up, basically. And it was just to accept failure and accept that you don't always get it right. You have off days, but it's about just going again. Yeah. Just, just picking up and going again. Because yeah, I know um, I've seen in in uh, like you, I've seen guys who've came in. I mean, they, they've came in and then a year and a half they're they're at uh, blue belt level and they're, they're they're tapping everyone out. They're just just those kind of people just they see something once they've got it in their head, and, and you often find uh, that sometimes those those people. Who, who do really well become the teacher's pat and all and they're, they're smoking everyone and then after two or three years yeah. they, they just they give up they kind of go I'm, I'm, I'm done um, yeah. and yeah. I think it, it's very easy in a certain sense to kind of think yourself I don't think I'm cut out for this they're, they're obviously better but that's not as you said it's not always an, an indicator of who's going to be successful or, or, or all it's things. not and it's very sim- it's, it, it's very similar to a school environment as well it's like I didn't do very well at school and the people that did, you're quite envious of them that they find learning easy and you think, God, they're going to be usually successful. They've got it all together. They've got it all going on and they just haven't. Yeah. And some of them go on to do absolutely nothing. Some of them go on to do very, very, I suppose, mediocre jobs. Yeah. And, and you kind of, you go on to excel uh, ahead of them. And yeah. it's just, it's just really not. And it's just, again, it's our psychology. It's like social comparison theory where the only way that we can gauge success is, is by doing that, uh, by looking at others and comparing ourselves to others. And it's, it's again, it's an illusion. It's faulty. Uh, it, it really is. Often you don't know how close you are or how capable you are of achieving something. And you, it can be sabotaged by looking at other people and getting switched off. Yeah, definitely. And, and especially, I think, even with today, social media, um, it's very easy to see highlights of people's success rules and then they go, I should just quit. I'll, I'll never, everyone else is getting better than me. I'll just throw in the towel. But again, you're not seeing the whole picture. And, and you're often, we often undersell our own capabilities, our own journey. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'm doing crap. Everybody else is doing doing better than me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I know we're, we're getting close to the end, and again, there, there, there is quite a lot to talk about. But we'll have to do it again, mate. Yeah, that that that'd be great. Um, 
before we before we uh, before we wrap up, um, you you went into uh, we called you served as uh, one of the once you left the Royal Marines, you went into anti piracy. Yes, and you were on the one of the you're on the ship. I think you I remember you said you were eating. I think in an interview, I seen you eat, said you were eating your dinner, and you got the radio call that you were under attack. Could you yeah. briefly could you briefly go over that story and um, sure and, and how it ties into managing fear? Because I know you said that when you seen what yeah. you were up against, there's only you and yeah. three other guys, wasn't there? Yeah, there were four of us. Yeah, four. yeah. So we basically, I'd, uh, at that stage, I'd gone out to do uh, private counter-piracy work in Somalia, basically just protecting ships and the crew going past uh, in the Indian Ocean, in, the, in what was deemed the high-risk area uh, off the coast of Somalia. And I'd done about 50 or 60 high-risk transits, and I just thought at some point, because there were, there were attacking ships every single day, uh, two or three hijackings or attempted hijackings a day in 2011, that I just thought that at some point, my time were going to come where they'd, they'd come to try and attack us and hijack our vessel. And it was such a, an uncomfortable reality. And I got on a ship in Malta and took it down the Suez Canal. And we met uh, another three of the team members in Suez, which is uh, at the south entrance of the Suez Canal. And then we set sail down the Red Sea. And the ship was heavily laden with iron ore, which meant that it had sunk. Uh, so much in the water that it only had like a five metre freeboard so somebody could come on a boat and just step onto it. It also meant that it didn't go very fast, uh, like seven or eight knots, which is, I don't know, six or seven mile an hour. Uh, and I were uncomfortable, really were uncomfortable. And lo and behold, uh, I were eating my dinner one night on the, I think it was 6th of August, at half past six at night, I can remember it clearly. And uh, one of the lads radioed who was on bridge wing watch and just said, like, you need to get up here because I was the team leader. You've got, we've got skiffs coming in at high speed, which are speedboats. Uh, so I ran up all these stairs and I was like absolutely knackered when I got to the top and also like in strict panic and, and hyperventilating. And I kind of looked through the binoculars and uh, I could see straight away that it was hostile and that they were coming to, to attack our vessel and, and try and hijack it. And when I looked through, they had the weapons up in the air and, and, and some rockets and stuff. And uh, and then more boats just started coming from all different angles. And they ended up being about 10 or 11 skiffs full of pirates that came uh, to, to get the vessel. And my immediate reaction, which was completely uncontrollable, was, was the flight element of the fight and flight and, I 100% thought we were going to get killed. And that realisation was so uncomfortable. It was just absolutely disgusting. And I, I did briefly think that we had to surrender just to kind of preserve any kind of percentage of life that we had. But I kind of knew after a couple of deep breaths, and this is the fear aspect, that it were irrational and that we, we only had one way out and that were to just take a deep breath and just kind of slot into a really trained notion of, 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 of getting this over the line. And we just took some simple processes that were just really, really, thank God to the Marines, a, a, a natural process of just breaking it down and just and taking it step by step and just getting the fundamentals right. And we had amazing communication between the four of us and a really, really solid team. And over 35, 40 minutes, we, we, we repelled that attack. Uh, and nobody got injured and they, they didn't manage to get on board and it was just it's really weird I always say it but halfway through the the attack which seemed to go on for ages uh, I got like this sixth sense that we were winning and that we were no longer going to die and that feeling it wasn't visual it was just a sense that we were we were winning we were we were winning this and that we were going to be alright and it was just such a massive, massive sense of elation. Uh, I went and made the lads a cup of tea halfway through it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we just, in between firing some shots, we'd have a drink of tea and, and, and crack back on. And it was just mental, absolutely mental. But 
uh, I think the only time in my life where I thought it, it were game over. And the crazy thing about it was is that I'd just started kind of exploring psychology and I'd come to the the self-conclusion that uh, when you die, you're completely switched off and that you're just in, if you've ever been like put to sleep for operation, you're just in this abyss. And it didn't help because I didn't believe in anything after. Yeah. So for me, death was definitive. And it, I just really, really, really in that moment struggled with it to come to terms with that outcome of what I perceived was going to happen. But yeah, yeah. it was just an incredible moment. And did you, did you some kind of, uh, I knew you were taking deep breaths, not just like normal deep breaths, or were you taking some kind of, some breathing? <laughs> no, I just, of... I had to compose myself. I had to, uh, I, like, I had to just, just take a step back and there was still a lot in that that I could control uh, and just, there was still time. And once I'd kind of quickly got to that, that there were, there were time to, to come to some kind of resolution and, and, and think with clarity and just really, really concentrating on, on just getting my breaths down. It was really straight. As soon as the first shot were fired, which were a warning shot into the water, all that just went. Yeah. It all just went. And it would, it would, I suppose, very similar to having a boxing fight or a fight in the street or playing rugby. You're really, really nervous and you've got all this anticipation. But as soon as you make the first contact or you get tackled or you tackle somebody, it just all goes and it just suddenly all makes sense. And that's just exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, no, it's fascinating because it heard, I said, I listened to that story and we're doing another interview and I thought that was really, really interesting. Uh, it ties in again with, with one of the lessons in the book. Um, yeah. Definitely going to ask, because uh, again, there's a lot to, to, a lot I'd like to go into. Would you be happy to come on again for a follow up? Mate, absolutely. Absolute, mate, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It would be, it'd be a pleasure, mate. If you just, yeah. just let me know and we can hook up and we can do it again. That'd be great, thank you. Um, just before we wrap up, um, what, what's what's next for yourself? Uh, I, know, I think you have a possible another book. I would absolutely love to write another book. Uh, I'm just currently jotting down some titles and some avenues that I could kind of take uh, that come to me just every now and again, but I'd love to write another book. Uh, the original manuscript that I submitted to publishers, it had life after the Marines and what I did in private security uh, and why I left the Marines and then some time, some stuff that I did in Afghanistan for close protection. And we naturally just cut that uh, after training because we put the lessons in it. It just made sense to finish it after training. So there's kind of something already there. It's just whether anybody wants to do anything with it. Uh, but I think if not, I'll step away from, in a sense, the, the military theme and just look at, I don't know, mindset or, or what we don't get taught at school and, and just, but yeah, I would love to write again. It's been an incredibly tough journey, but uh, it's all worthwhile now. Excellent. No, um, no I have a great look forward to it. Um, Gareth, thank you much for your, for your time today. Um, it was great having you on again. Um, there's, there's more we can definitely talk about. Uh, sure. Fremont, Fremont Watson, um, the book's available on Amazon, uh, Waterstones, and then the audio version is on Audible, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah, you can get it on 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 Apple, uh, Apple Books, uh, both the ebook and, and and the audio, but also Amazon for the ad back and Waterstones and W H Smiths. But the yeah for audio, you can get it on Audible, Audible as well. That's great. And if, just before we go, uh, if someone wants to get in touch with yourself, how can they how can they do that? Sure, absolutely, mate. So. Uh, via the website, which is uh, 0.1.co.uk. Uh, on Instagram, I'm uh, Gareth Timmins, but the, I suppose the handle is becoming the 0.1%, 0.1%. And then Twitter, Gareth Timmins, and, and likewise on Facebook, it's becoming the 0.1%, which is the page. So just if anybody wants to get in touch, just get in touch and I'll, I'll always respond and, and try and help if I can. That's great. No, excellent. And I'll put the links in the description. Um, Gareth, thank you so much. 
and uh, pleasure mate really enjoyed that and uh, thank you for your time and, and, and sharing your knowledge and wisdom thank you very much for inviting me on mate it's been it's been a pleasure and it's been well, I, 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 we'll, we'll do it again i'm sure thank you